Well, welcome to everyone tuning in. My name is Aaron Anderson, and I'm one of the founders of ICS. And today I'm here with Mark Ellis. Welcome, Mark. Um, Mark is a renowned author and Jewish liberation theologian who has authored numerous books. Notably, he's been outspoken about the cause of Palestinian liberation and justice and peace in Israel and Palestine. He has spent years developing the idea of the Jewish prophetic, which focuses on the ways the ancient Jewish prophetic tradition has spread beyond the boundaries of the Jewish community and into the world, and a tradition that now has the potential to speak back into the Jewish community itself, especially with the prophetic criticism of Zionism. Mark is also very familiar with the ins and outs of Christian communities. He spent a lifetime in dialogue with Christians, especially those in the Catholic worker movement. He's a retired professor of Jewish studies at Baylor University, and he's been a visiting professor at a number of institutions, including the United Nations mandated University for Peace in Costa Rica, as well as the University of Innsbruck in Austria. I'm also very pleased to say that Mark has recently joined the advisory board at ICS and has very graciously offered to join us during Holy Week uh, to have a conversation about Christianity's relationship to Judaism, liberation theology, and most seriously, the relationship of Christianity to the stain of anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism. I also wanna make sure we plug uh, a very important, exciting new book. Uh, it's a uh, book in tribute to Mark Ellis. Uh, Mark has a book here with us, which you can hold up for those who are interested. Uh, that book is called The New Diaspora and the Global Prophetic, Encountering the Work of Mark Ellis. Looks very interesting and exciting. Feel free to pick it up um, and get to know Mark's work just a little bit better. Also in the uh, recorded video uh, that's posted to YouTube, we'll make sure to mention some of Mark's uh, uh, books and other important articles and works. Um, Mark, thank you for joining us. Again, we've invited you here, uh, especially because we're in the middle of the Christian Holy Week, uh, which anticipates and celebrates the final days and moments of Jesus's life, as well as his death and resurrection. These few days of Holy Week, I think, present a special predicament, especially for liberationist Christians like ourselves at ICS, because uh, for us, despite this awful legacy and ongoing threat of anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism, these things unequivocally have no place in any liberative Christianity. That's not to say that they can't rear their ugly head as they often do, but that we have to have a conscious struggle to recognize their presence and fight for a world where anti-Semitism no longer is with us. And that said, we have to reckon with this legacy and put very hard questions to ourselves as Christians and to see where these damnable legacies are still informing and coloring our vision of a more just and free world. And even to see if there's any possibility of, of overcoming them. Um, and speaking for myself, I would say I spent 20 years uh, in a very conservative evangelical form of Christianity um, where anti-Jewish and supersessionist readings of scripture weren't just byproducts of faith, they were front and center. Um, and though I'm very far from that tradition now, as I've navigated my way through Christianity after evangelicalism, and I've come to realize that liberationist Christianity is kind of the only one worth fighting for, for me, there's still no question that this problem of anti-Semitism and supersessionist theology plague all kinds of Christianity and do themselves raise their heads within leftist politics to varying degrees. So Holy Week really brings these problems to a head. Um, perhaps no other narratives in the Gospels have lent themselves so much to supersessionist and anti-Semitic understandings of Christianity and Judaism. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation with you uh, to learn from your wisdom and, and to help our, our uh, viewers learn a little bit more about how they can understand this legacy, struggle against it, and, and, and learn to appropriate a more humble form of Christianity in dialogue with the kinds of things you think about and write about. Um, so if it's okay with you, I thought we'd just begin with your life and work, your relationship to this tradition of Jewish liberation theology, something you've written and spoke about for decades. You've often said you're a part of a minority group of Jews of conscience, which I think is connected to this idea of liberation theology for you. 
So how do you understand Jewish liberation theology and, and how has that been something in dialogue with other liberationist Christians? Well, first, uh, thanks for inviting me. And of course, it's not only Easter coming up, uh, but Passover. So we're at a very interesting time. Uh, and of course, you know that uh, the Easter week has been fraught for Jews in many parts of the world over time, and less so now, which is fantastic. Uh, and now Passover, of course, has another dimension because that's really the first time in modern Jewish history where we've been empowered. Uh, and we are using that power to oppress another people, the Palestinian people. So none of our traditions are innocent. Uh, and we can't just go to our traditions for the future. And yet we also can't go to the future without them. So uh, Jews are now not in the same position of Christians because Christians have a longer, much longer and wider uh, history of not only oppressing Jews, but many peoples around the world, Yes, which is how Christianity became a global religion. And maybe uh, Judaism would have followed the same path, but we were uh, compressed, shall we say, by Christianity and oppressed. Uh, so, uh, you know, none of us are innocent. And this is really where a Jewish theology of liberation came from. Yeah. Uh, me waking up one day or over time, thinking that uh, when I was growing up, of course, we, we as Jews thought we were better than the others, which were Christians. And in general, we were. <laughs> yeah, in general, we were. But, but uh, when I began to meet Palestinians uh, in the 1980s and travel with them in Jerusalem and the West Bank and Gaza, and for many of the Palestinians, I was the first Jew they ever met that wasn't an Israeli soldier. Mm -hmm. And seeing what I saw there uh, confronted me with what Christians are confronted with, again, on a global scale. Is it possible that a Jew could act the way Jews are acting? And uh, I'm sure that you may have woken up one day and said, is it possible for Christians to act the way that we're acting? And then the question is, what do you do about it? Uh, and how do you speak? You want to think of your traditions as good, and especially with children, to pass them down as good. But you also want to be honest in an age-appropriate way, including with yourself. Mm. And uh, much of our theology that grows out of this encounter with the other side of our traditions and our peoples is an attempt to readjust our scope and to reduce the cognitive dissonance of what we're seeing. And liberation theology, in some ways, is an attempt to reduce the cognitive dissonance. Christianity is supposed to be like this, but it's been like this. But it can't be like this. It's got to be like this, but it isn't. What do you, what do, you do? Mm -hmm. Same thing with Judaism. And of course, Islam uh, will have to do this too at some point, and Hinduism and Buddhism and secularism and all of this, we, we all have a lot of work to do. Yes. And the Jewish theology of liberation in, in difference from Christian theology of liberation was not dealing with the poor who need to be liberated, but the liberated who are now oppressing another people, the liberated yeah. who were per, poor and oppressed, now oppressing another people. And you mentioned the Catholic worker, but as formative was my years at Mary Knoll, where I began to meet teaching there, where I began to meet the great liberation theologians of the world and in dialogue with them. <laughs> when they came to Mary Knoll, they thought, well, what is a Jew, you know, Jew is teaching at Mary Knoll? But they had no problem with that. Uh, not at all. They were, they were fascinated by it. And we had many discussions and what interested them in my liberation theology was empowerment, oppressing others. They didn't have a chance to deal with that then because the poor of Latin America don't have a chance to oppress others because they're not empowered. Uh, and also, I saw some other Jews who were working on the issue, but they weren't being honest. 
And part of my Jewish theology liberation, theology of liberation came from this rage about the dishonesty of those who were speaking for Palestinians. There was something wrong. And I think most liberation theology comes from this basic understanding, something is wrong. What do we do about it? And how can we speak about it? And what makes sense? And of course, then you're putting yourself in a very vulnerable uh, situation, especially for Jews now, where everyone on the progressive side wants to embrace Jews. But they're embracing often a romanticized view of Jews, which is for their theology and their conscience, and has nothing to do with Jews. And this is one of the deep problems with Christianity, is that Christianity has never dealt with Jews as real people, were either uh, demons or angels. And uh, Jewish theology of liberation says, uh, we're neither. Um, and what does the tradition have to say about it? And what has to change in the tradition? And can we speak directly, not about theory, not about tropes, not about, you know, get to the point. What we're doing historically to Palestinians, what we did was wrong, and what we are doing is wrong. As simple as that. Now, having said that, and confessed it, what do we do about it? That's a Jewish theology of liberation in a nutshell. That's fantastic. I learned a lot <laughs> just in those few minutes. Thank you. Um, and, and I can imagine there's plenty for thought and action there, especially for liberationist Christians who are also looking at um, a very hegemonic force in America, which is the Christian right, which does in fact itself claim Christianity and do great harm in its name. And so that this way of thinking about liberation theology, both as a form of emancipation and agency for the poor, but also a way of self-critique, I think has many, many different overlaps and things to teach for Christians. Um, and I wonder, you know, one of these ways you, you talk about uh, Jews being made into a caricature um, very often so as to do great harm to them. I think, uh, of course, of, um, the, the problem of, in Christian theology, especially of supersessionism, right? So this idea that um, th there is a way in which Christians and the Christian church have superseded, have taken over um, the status of the chosen people of God, uh, leaving the Jews in the dust. And in many cases, this has resulted in all kinds of historic harm and violence against Jews. Um, there's, there's much debate among Christians now, even those that take this legacy seriously, as well as their Jewish interlocutors, as you've suggested, that whether a kind of non-supersessionist Christianity is even possible at all. And I wonder, especially because, as I've said, we're at Holy Week, um, you know, perhaps no other time, uh, right, are, are, are we so vulnerable, I think, to some of the readings of Christian scripture, the Gospels, um, that, that have led themselves to ways of caricaturing and doing violence to uh, Jews, the people of Israel and the Jewish religion. Um, you know, to many of our Christian uh, viewers, you know, they'll be familiar with some uh, canonical uh, passages, right? For instance, in the gospel of Matthew uh, during the trial of Jesus, when, um, you know, Pilate declares he's innocent of Jesus's blood, right? And turns this back to, the Jewish leadership saying it's your responsibility and they all answer back in the gospel passage of Matthew his blood be on us and our children right or I think of the the narratives of the temple events right when Jesus is depicted as kind of coming into the temple and disrupting some of what's going on there um, and and the ways that these have been mobilized then towards anti-Jewish anti-Semitic readings um, I'm just curious to know uh, from you during Holy Week, as we as Christians are reading, meditating on, liturgically using these passages, um, you know, it, it, first of all, could you talk to us a bit about the legacy of supersessionist theology, what it might have to do with these narratives of Holy Week, um, and, and how we as Christians, especially liberationist Christians, might learn to appropriate these texts, use them, in a way that doesn't end up reproducing the same supersessionist anti-Semitic readings. 
Well, I think on one, one part of me wants to say you're stuck with it. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when these, and I've been in churches on Easter, you know, I, I have many experiences. Uh, you just, Christians can't help themselves. Okay, all right. I don't want to do a stand-up comedy, but, <laughs> uh, and Jews can't help themselves, and Muslims can't help themselves, and Hindus, and we also can. But when those Gospels are read out, you know, we, we have these parallel churches, which are the seminaries were parallel, the progressive seminaries were parallel churches. By the way, they did almost nothing with the Jewish theology of liberation. Mm. The liberation theology is talked about almost never is a Jewish theology of liberation mentioned, or if it's mentioned, it's a sidelight. But they're talking all about Jews the whole time, and Christianity is all about Jews, including your Savior. I mean, let's face it, it's saturated with Jews, and the Gospels, and I, we don't, okay, we don't really know much about Jesus. We only know through the Gospels and some historical. But what we have in the tradition, when it's read in church, people aren't saying, oh, yes, I'm going to go to a seminary and listen to how this passage really doesn't mean what it seems to be saying to me out loud. That's never going to work on a mass level. Now, there are those who will take it and say, you know what? I just reject that. Maybe it didn't mean that. Maybe it did. I reject it. There, there will always be those Christians who do that, and I'm glad about it. Uh, but to fixate on cleaning up the Christian scriptures, which there has been a lot of fixation on it, and much good. But in the end, when a liturgy is pronounced, people are deep in a liturgical sense. They don't have an academic blackboard there. Mm -hmm. And the preachers, some of them do a great job. And it just, in, in a sense, goes over people's heads. Or some people, of course, in the congregation take it seriously. And some just say, I'm not listening to that. But in a sense, I would say you're stuck with that tradition. And you will endlessly interpret it and reinterpret it. And some of it is so positive to Jews that Jews are seen as angels. It's just the opposite. It's just the demonization or the romanticization, but nothing in between. So liturgy, and I, I've read and I appreciate Christian attempts to clean up Christianity <laughs> with luck. Mm. Now, here's the deal. People have to be empowered enough to say no to Christianity even the better kind if they want to. And the great thing about Jewish empowerment is to say, say what you want, my door is closed. Mm -hmm. Or say what you want, my door is open, we can discuss it. As long as Christians don't have power over us mm -hmm. to enforce their interpretation of the gospel, let people believe what they want to believe because Christianity has many beliefs some of them are fantastic, and some of them are stupid, and everything in between, just like Judaism and Islam. And that will be the way it is forever. Now, there are Jews of conscience, Christians of conscience, Muslims of conscience, Hindus of conscience, Buddhists of conscience, secular people of conscience, who are trying to deal with their traditions and or leave them. Sometimes they're trying to do both, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's the great thing about being free to leave, mm. but you don't really ever leave, do you? Mm. And, and I'm not saying we should, uh, but, you know, when you get into to Jewishness today, you have all sorts of things. And uh, for instance, a Jew can believe that Israel is the promised land for Jews. They just can't act that way against Palestinians. And Christian Zionists, they can believe that uh, the end times and all of that. They just can't act on it. That's where we need to stop. I, I don't want to interfere with people's beliefs. But once you have these scriptures, which can be interpreted so many different ways, it's always going to be there, these different interpretations. And you have to choose. And we do choose. But 
the point about Christians that I've been reading on Facebook, for instance, we have this thing against Christian satyrs. This is the latest thing that yes. a lot of the Christian hierarchy is saying, don't do it mm -hmm. because you'll offend Jews. But they say the same thing about talking about Palestine. Don't talk about Palestine. You might offend the local rabbi. So a lot of this stuff is offensive. And the question is, is whether our offense against others is belief, including racism, or action. And the action has to be stopped. Now, when it's stopped, maybe we can think again and think about how to clean up all of our traditions and all of our communities <laughs> and do better. And the better we do, the better we are. But there's no pure, there, there's no way to a pure Christianity or pure Jewish or a pure Islam. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to admonish people for their beliefs, but I'm willing to admonish people for their actions. Yes. That's different. I really resonate, Mark, with what you said about the, the sort of um, the, the problems that are presented by reading um, gospel passages that have been mobilized and lend themselves towards anti-Jewish readings and, and, and how it's things like liturgy and spirituality, perhaps where anti-Jewish attitudes are at their height because it's just culturally in the water, right? There's, there's not that, as you said, academic check, right? There's not someone there telling you, look what this has done. Um, and I, I wonder, because you have gestured towards the possibility of Christians that can check it and Christians that can vocally and with their, their bodies and their voices say stop, um, what, what are some of the ways that you envision Christians of conscience doing this, right? So if it's so much in the water, especially in our liturgy, in our worship, in our spirituality, what is the role of, of Christians of conscience, critical Christians, perhaps now even during Holy Week when these passages are, are being read everywhere, what, what, what is our role in saying, stop, check yourself, be aware that that question makes sense? Well, I think one of the ways of not doing it is these movements periodically of reclaiming Jesus mm. in the public square, mm. reclaiming Christ. We have the Jim Wallace and Sojourners and others who periodically under Trump and, and other times are reclaiming. And I, I think, oh, my God, don't mm. do that. Hmm. Please don't 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 reclaim it. You have a history, especially Western Christians, which you're paying up for. Huh. And you're going to be paying up for it a long, long time, not only from Jews. So that's a burden you have. And now Jews have a burden. We don't recognize it as much as many Christians do. And I give a lot of credit to Christians of conscience because very few Jews understand the burden that has come upon us in oppressing the Palestinian people. Mm -hmm. And we often hit out at Christians, stop doing this, stop doing that. And Christians are just praying this or that, or they're saying this or that. They can't really even touch us now. But that's also a way often of keeping Christians quiet about Palestine. This is what I call the interfaith ecumenical deal. That was a dialogue, which was good. We, we're, in a sense, talking about a dialogue between Jews and Christians and others, uh, which became a deal. So some of the progressive movements uh, in the interfaith arena have also uh, been blockages toward what we as Jews need. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, I think of seminaries, uh, very prominent progressive seminaries who now have Jews on their board and sometimes Muslims, and you think, well, that's great, or Jews teaching Jesus. So I, I love that, and that's fantastic. Yeah. But then when you're in that seminary and you want to have a thing about Palestine, well, that, that's, is that going to offend the rabbi on the board or the Jewish faculty member? Or teaching Jesus and the rabbinic aspect of Jesus, which I agree with, but then used against Christianity Christians who are saying, you know what, let's move. So we have a lot of progress in this arena, a tremendous amount of progress. And that's why we can talk and we can even laugh together. Yes. <laughs> I mean, some of it is, you know, it's Monty Python stuff, to be honest, some of it. Uh, and that's a revolutionary. Uh, the biggest revolution, revolution in the history of Christianity 
is solidarity with Jews. Mm. That's the biggest change in the history of Christianity, in my view. Mm. And it's a good one. But you want to be in solidarity often with Jews that are just wonderful because that reclaims your scripture in a new way for you. Mm. But when it turns out, and to combat these myths about Jews, Jewish control of the media and all of that stuff, and this is very important. But when it turns out that in real life, we're doing something wrong, it becomes very hard for you to say, yeah, I'm against all of that other stuff, which was central to my tradition. Mm. Anti-Semitism was not peripheral or an add-on. It was at the center. Yes. There was no Christianity in the mainstream without that. Mm -hmm. Now there's been a revolution, and I applaud that revolution. And not just because it makes me safer, which it does, but because it's better. The temptation, though, to revert, even on the left, is there. And I've seen it in many, many, you know, as a person who has gone out there to speak around the world, believe me, I've seen everything about Jews. Uh, including in the, on the left, and some of it is deeply anti-Jewish, mm. and some of it is not, and a lot of it's not. But uh, we can't seem to get to a place where we can deal as human beings in solidarity with each other. So, for instance, if you say, I'm not going to say this to the local rabbi because it will really anger him, and I really want to go to his synagogue and pray with it, you know, all of this stuff, uh, is that a solidarity with the Jewish people in Jewish history? Is the silence of Christian seminaries, basic silence, in the great liberation theology seminaries on Jews, uh, Jewish theology of liberation, is that in Palestinians, is that a solidarity with the Jewish people? That's cowardice. That's a fear of your own anti-Semitism in the tradition, but maybe also in yourself, because let's face it, Christians have ambivalent views about Jews. Now we're going to the liturgy. You can't go to one of those gospel readings during this week and often during, without having ambivalent feelings about Jews. Now, you may be fighting them, and why not? And that's great. But anyone who's been in a church, it's, it's sort of like saying about whites that all whites in the United States have a racism within them. That's true. I agree with that. And my view is that all Christians are ambivalent about Jews mm -hmm. because they're ambivalent about Christianity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Jews have ambivalence, too, about Judaism and about others. So we're all ambivalent. We don't yeah. need Freud to lecture us on ambivalence. <laughs> You no, know, a Jewish, I mean, you know, it makes sense that a Jew would uh, yes. uh, give us a sense of ambivalence. So what do we do with our, instead of looking for a purity or rising above or combating, why don't we just admit that some of the great people that I've met, Christians, who are really deeply committed, are deeply ambivalent about Jews. That doesn't mean they hate them. They're not anti-Semitic. That's a whole nother thing. Mm -hmm. There's a deep ambivalence in Christian culture, in Islamic culture, and in modern culture, a deep ambivalence about Jews. Mm. Okay, so what are we gonna do about it? As long as I have the power to protect myself and other Jews, we can deal with that ambivalence, and it's good for you that we have that power. There's an ambivalence about Jews being empowered, about Jews speaking too much about Jews always knowing that, you know, I mean, I, I run into it all the time. Even when you're asked to be the central speaker, somebody could say to you about, you're speaking too much. I said, well, you know, I, I was asked to be the... <laughs> yeah. So we have to laugh about it because we can now, but it's also serious during this week. But everything in Christianity is about Jews. There's no way out of it. Some of it's wonderful, some of it's awful, and it's deeply ambivalent. Thank you, Mark. That was, that was a profoundly interesting and very challenging um, answer. I, I take it to heart, especially because um, 
you know, I, I think uh, we at ICS like to think that part of liberation Christianity is a really dogged commitment to recognizing and owning up to the failures that Christianity um, has overseen, right? And and the ways that that ignoring those failures or trying to distance yourself from them, to not take ownership of them, always helps to reproduce them again in different forms. Um, so that there's there's much to take to heart here, and I really appreciate also your your perspective on the way these sorts of things live in the institutions, the institutionalization of progressive Christianity, mm -hmm. and very often that the battles will be there. And we all know again as as um, progressives or leftists that that those sorts of battles do take all kinds of solidarity not just spiritual and theological but a kind of political solidarity um i thought i would just turn quickly uh now that we're kind of on the question of political solidarity uh, to, to one of the i think um keystone narratives uh that we read during holy week of jesus in the temple and i say keystone because i think it's fair to say for a lot of leftist christians if you were to ask them uh, why are you a leftist, or how does Jesus inspire your vision of leftism, anti-capitalism, things like that, they would very quickly turn uh, to a handful of passages, one of them being the story of Jesus in the temple, uh, which has for a very long time uh, often been dubbed the cleansing of the temple, that term itself being very problematic, right? Um, and, and, and this passage, again, is one of the main ones that has been used and mobilized for anti-Semitic readings, um, especially, you know, servicing caricatures of Jews as being greedy or obsessed with money and interest and things like this, right? Or as hypocrites, pharisaical. Um, and the different accounts of this uh, event in the Gospels don't always make this problem any easier. And I think I've heard you say, Mark, already that there might just be a problem period here in the way this is narrated. But I'm curious to know um, one thing that's struck me in reading this passage um, this year is that you know, um, well, it could be the case, and I'll, I'll let you talk about this, that that the passage just presents interminable problems for Christians, even of a liberationist uh, type. I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about whether there are, what's happening in this text, first of all, for you, um, you know, whether it's hopelessly mired in anti-Jewish ideas or whether there is something important and liberationist about it. I mean, one thing that has struck me, I wanted to say, is that um, it, it seems to me that it, it could be very important for Christians who care about reading the Gospels in a political and economic way, right, um, to look at this passage and ask the question, is there something genuinely political, uh, radical about what Jesus is doing here, right? Again, for an evangelical like me, if there's nothing more happening than Jesus simply making a ruckus <laughs> and making a mess, right, um, it would seem that like a non-political reading of this temple narrative does just lend itself to anti-Semitic interpretations, right? He's just there to upset everything, to challenge Jewish spiritual life, um, to perhaps even destroy the temple, right? Um, so I would love to hear from you, speaking especially to leftist Christians who are tuning in, what's happening here? How should we read this passage? Um, and, and are there ways that, that liberationists and leftist Christians can look at what's happening in these events insofar as we have them mediated to us through the gospels and 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 use them and 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 um, uh, you know learn to live through them again without reducing everything down to tropes. If that question makes sense. Well, I'm not an expert on the New Testament, but I find it uh, quite interesting, and I've learned a lot through my time at the Catholic Worker at Mary Knoll and at Baylor University, and so I have uh, and going around the world. Yeah, uh, and the people I'm compared to by these Christians, you know, and it, it's a, it's a fascinating journey. Um, to me, for uh, knowing that we don't know much about Jesus, okay, but we're just going with the tradition. Historically, yes. we don't know much. It's like the Exodus. Um, you know, I believe that the prophetic is the indigenous of Jewish. That's our indigenous. And we're the only people with that particular indigenous. And it's the root of the global prophetic. So if you look at Jesus, the way I would look at Jesus after this long time, I, when growing up, I didn't know anything about Jesus or Christianity at all. We had um, one Gentile, as my father used to call 
on the block. Uh, he just never <laughs> got over the fact that they were Gentiles. Um, so I grew up in a Jewish uh, neighborhood, went to Hebrew school, bar mitzvah, and all of that. Um, is that Jesus, for me, represents the indigenous of Jewish, the indigenous prophetic. And therefore, all sorts of things that he does or he did or didn't do, but he does in the Gospels, makes perfect sense to me as a Jew. And including overturning the tables, whatever that means. And we could get great scholars much better on the New Testament. But again, that's really not the issue, is it? Mm. Because when you use it in a political way, the, the chalkboards aren't going to be out there. Mm. And people are going to use it as a way that will lead to all sorts of things, include progress, but also a reversion yes. about this deep ambivalence. Mm. Why would Jesus have to cleanse the table? Well, the Jews. Mm -hmm. And then some really good, well-meaning Christians say, well, we're all like that. But that, that, that the, uh, yeah, it's like uh, Jesus was rejected in the gospel by the Jews, but we all reject Jesus. Yes, right. And I think, yeah, but Jews are read out loud. Mm. So uh, if you look at Jesus as representing the indigenous Jewish prophetic, which then became, through a series of circumstances, Christianity, and then through a series of circumstances, became global, and took Jewish from that perspective around the world. I mean, Judaism is a global religion because of Christianity and Islam. I mean, it's not global in terms of population. My God, we maybe 15 million Jews in the whole world. Mm. But it's global because Christianity and Islam expropriated Jewishness. Mm. Now, we don't, we, don't, we don't talk about it that way. And in fact, the, I, I knew Edward Said. Mm. I loved Edward Said, and I traveled with him sometimes. And I, I don't want to exaggerate it, but uh, I was... He used to call me a good friend. I wasn't a friend of Edward Said's, but I traveled with him and I had a relationship with him. And of course, his great book, Orientalism. Mm -hmm. But the greatest Orientalism in the world is toward Jews because of Christianity and Islam. And through that, modernity. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're the most talked about people in the world. It's, I, I'm not using that as we should be or shouldn't be. We are the most talked about, and this week, the most talked about people in the world, oh. but we're not even there. Mm. So when you get to Jesus in the temple, I mean, you know, it, it's already, the train's already left the station. Uh, this is why I'm very, I don't want people mobilized by religion. I'm deeply religious and I'm a secular Democrat. Now, we could argue about what that means, but basically, we should act in common as citizens and others with others in the localities and the regions that we live in. We should not be mobilized by religion. We might be personally mobilized by religion. Uh, so the Jesus in the, the temple as a rallying cry is already problematic, and it's going to happen over and over again, because that's why we think out of these patterns, all of us, religious patterns, the most iconic is Moses and Aaron in, the te in, in Pharaoh's temple, mm. in the palace. I think about that all the time, and I think of the burning bush. You know, nobody's seen a burning bush that's burned and burned and burned that doesn't burn. Mm -hmm. But yet that's very important to me, but I'm not going to go out in public and say, burning bush, not consumed, let's move. <laughs> That's really helpful. Um, and, and to take kind of a wider lens, uh, th this really does touch on just the whole question. Um, again, important to the hearts of Christian radicals, Christian leftists, of, of whether and in what sense you could talk about Jesus being a radical figure, right? As you've helped us kind of pull apart, there's the question of radical in the texts, uh, radical as we know him, radical as the gospels tell us he is. Um, there are different ways of understanding this, but um, you know, I, I think there's a deep desire for politically involved Christians on the left 
um, to counter spiritualizing interpretations of Jesus, because those spiritualizing interpretations are often uh, ways of producing forms of reactionary and oppressive politics, right? And there have been a, a lot of folks uh, in Christian scholarly circles and activist circles. I think, for instance, of Aubrey Hendricks Jr., who's also on our advisory board, who's written a book entitled The Politics of Jesus, which takes both his Jewishness very seriously yeah. and basically begins by saying, um, for him as a Christian, the entrance of God out of the stage of history is in response to oppression, the oppression of the Israelite people, right? That's where the story begins. Right. Um, and he, he traces that all the way to the, the Jewish Jesus as one who is declaring through his life and ministry, the one sovereign God, right? Especially right. over Rome. And so there are all these ways that Christians have sought to, while not trying to anachronize, right? Or make Jesus into something that he's not, have sought to understand his life in an extraordinarily political, economic, radical way. I'm wondering if if you if you, if you find that whole notion itself um, useful, problematic, right? So not just the, the temple narratives, any one discrete narrative, but this whole project of kind of rooting in radical Christianity in a radical figure named Jesus. How, how do you, as, as as a Jew and a scholar and a liberation theologian, think about that term and the way Christians have used it? Well, first of all, I've read a lot. I haven't read that book, but I've read a lot and a lot, and I enjoy it. And I've learned uh, a lot from Christians, and some of my best friends are Christian. But I'm an agnostic on this, and uh, I understand it. It's like battling your whole life. again. And you think a Jewish theology of liberation is a struggle within my own tradition. But I just thought about it when I wrote it as my voice. I had to speak. I, I didn't have a strategy. I'm... Strategies, and now we also have other things that become religious. So this whole thing about colonialism, as if that covers all the bases, that's a religious idea, which becomes a, basically. So we're all involved in our traditions, in our histories, and we're all battling, and we're struggling, and we're struggling, and we're, we're, we're singing together, we're holding hands, we shall overcome. We're not going to overcome. It's not going to happen that way. And this is what I'm trying to get across in some of my writing and even in my painting uh, without thinking about it. Um, we're not gonna overcome. The prophetic is not gonna run the world and probably shouldn't. But those of us who are drawn to, prophet to the prophetic must speak and then must endure exile. And what does that mean? You know, you say, well, it, some people ask me, did, did I think that my speech about, in my writing about Palestine would liberate Palestine? I never thought about it at all. Did I think I would solve? I never thought about that at all. I just had to find my voice. Now, there are other people who have found their voice, and now many more people than when I started out. And some of them have found my voice partly because of my voice. And some of those people who have found their voice partly because of my voice, I'm not so sure about their voice. So, you know, but the world is not, when you look at the global supply chain, when Trump did his things about China, I remember reading articles in the New York Times about the millions and millions of pounds of beef that were sitting in warehouses. I mean, the, the global trade and, and people need to eat. And you say, well, that's not the proper way to eat. But you know, the ideas of how we would move from one place to another place, we have to be very careful. And the, the prophets, if you look at them in the Hebrew Bible in the indigenous prophetic, mm -hmm. I don't mean tacked on prophetic. Mm -hmm. The prophetic is not indigenous to Christianity the way it is to Judaism. There are some mm -hmm. wonderful things that Christianity has that we can't touch, Islam too. But the one, the indigenous prophetic is unique. And those prophets do not succeed. Mm -hmm. Those prophets speak and then run and hope that God will be with them. And once in a while, God pops up and says, I'm gonna send ravens with food. And then other times God is AWOL, you know, thinking about something else. So that's where we are, really. When we get together and we sing, we shall overcome. I understand it. 
I usually try to take a bathroom break during that time because I think our thought has just ended. We're not going to overcome. Good. All right. Okay. What do we do? Now, that is where it becomes interesting and real when we realize. So, for instance, people ask me, what do you think about a Jewish theology of liberation didn't succeed? And now it failed. You know, as I spoke more and more and got better and better and better, the political situation devolved. You think that there's a bottom that it can reach in Israel-Palestine, and then there's a new bottom. And a new bottom. That doesn't mean there can't be change for good. But we carry the prophetic with us into exile. Now, in exile, we find other people who embrace the prophetic who are Jews, who are Christians, who are Muslims, who are Hindus, who, are, who don't want to have anything to do with any of that. Mm. Sometimes the brightest people. But yet, it's very superficial. We have non-Jews, non-Jew Jews, and non-Christian, you know, and then you hear them speak and you say, oh, it's so Jewish. <laughs> or so, oh, it's so Christian. Are you a Methodist? I, I, you know, how do you know? <laughs> uh, you know, and, and uh, it used to be when I was traveling among Catholics, you'd have women of a certain age come up to me and I would say, where were you a sister? She said, how do you know that? You could see it. Mm. You can hear it in the speech. So, these traditions have a hold on us, and appropriately so, as we struggle with them and sometimes against them. Mm -hmm. But the deeper issue is what are we going to do in our failure? It doesn't mean we set out to fail, but when we set out to succeed, notice we have to drop this and this. And people say, mm -hmm. well, Mark, when I started out, you know, if you didn't say this, you'd be much more accepted in the community. And then I said, no. These people cut 10, 20, 30% to make themselves available to other Jews, and Christians do this too, and you want to give gospel stories. That get, and the end is, you're dead in the water. So uh, my sense is that we have to carry the prophetic for those of us who are drawn to it as a negotiation with the powers that are and hope for better times, especially for those who need better times more than we do. Mm -hmm. But as one theologian said at a meeting in Mexico City, he said most Christian theology, he was a Christian liberationist, speak only to those Christians within a certain world that they exist in, Yes. But there are hundreds of millions and perhaps billions of people who are completely out of that. Mm -hmm. These are people who work on these ships who disappear. And, you know, there's a whole world out there that's not touched by this at all. Does that mean we shouldn't do it? No, but we should know the limits of it. Mm -hmm. The prophetic is always in exile. So let's get on with it. Very helpful, Mark. Um, I really appreciate you speaking uh, into our situation during Holy Week. Um, I think this has given people who have tuned in much to think about, much to reflect on. Um, I want to thank you for joining us. Um, it's It's been uh, a profound experience for me just to sit here and listen to you talk about these things. Um, and I, again, want to encourage people who have watched this to um, Again, uh, certainly do track down uh, Mark's multiple works, including the most recent tribute book to him, The New Diaspora and the Global Prophetic. Um, again, we'll be also adding some resources to the YouTube video about Mark's work. Um, and you can also learn more about what Mark is doing with us at uh, ICS's website, which is simply christiansocialism.com. Mark, um, we're profoundly grateful to join, to having you join us for the, the last, I think, 45 minutes or so. Um, it's, I think, been a, a great time of learning. It'll be a great resources for those who care deeply about unlearning some of these harmful patterns um, and broadening and deepening our experience of Christianity that owns up to its failure and joins in solidarity with people like yourself. So thank you again for joining us today. 
Well, thank you for having me, and I hope you have a good and meaningful Easter. Wonderful. Thank you.